Associate Justice Sabrina Shizao McKenna has served on the Hawaii Supreme Court since March 2011. She is the first openly LGBTQ plus Asian American justice to serve on the state court of last resort. She grew up in Japan before graduating from the University of Hawaii at Manoa in its William S. Richardson School of Law, where she served as a law review editor-in-chief. She was a civil litigator, general counsel to a Japan-based group of companies, and a WSRSL faculty member before serving as a Hawaii State Trial Court judge from 1993 to 2011 presiding over civil, criminal, and family matters. She has been involved in various Hawaii initiatives, as well as the domestic and international lectures on women's and civil rights issues. She serves on the Board of International Association of LGBTQ Plus Judges and on the co-chairs of the American Judicature Society's Judicial Diversity Committee. Her awards include the ABA's Margaret Brent Woman Lawyers of Achievement in 2023, the Stonewall Awards in 2021, and NAPABA's Daniel K. Noe Trailblazer Award in 2015. Please join me in welcoming Serena McKenna, Associate Justice of the Hawaii Supreme Court. Okay, so I'm going to move this because I, can I move this? Yes, I can, because I'm right brained So I like to look left when I, so I have my notes, I'm going to have my notes over here, and then I can glance at my notes while I'm talking to you. And I'll move this over, but I'm not really going to speak into it, uh, but I'll have it, you know, it might catch a little bit. Okay, so aloha, welcome, and thank you for having me. I'm really honored to be able to be here, and thank you for the introduction. I, um, I'm Sabrina Shizui McKenna. I was born and raised in Japan, spent six months in the Philippines. My mother was American, uh, no, my mother wasn't American. My mother was Japan Japanese from Hokkaido. My father was from the Midwest, and they met when my mother served as the secretary interpreter to the provost marshal, which is the base cop for, for Chitose Air Force Base in uh, Hokkaido uh, during the Korean War. My father was a tank uh, battalion commander for the army and they met and apparently uh, he was a friend of her boss and after several months of dating, they, he apparently said, if I come back alive, I wanna spend the rest of my life with you and then he was able to come back alive and he ended up resettling in Japan as an educator. He was a professor of psychology for uh, what is now University of Maryland Global Campus, you know, where they have all the courses for the military personnel. So I grew up in a household that really valued education, and so I'm really, really glad to see all of the university uh, people here. Um, I grew up, therefore, I grew up uh, speaking Japanese. Japanese is my first language. I'm bilingual. I'm bicultural. I grew up in a multi-religious background. I went to Sunday school. I also went to Buddhist funerals and Shinto weddings, and um, I would consider myself spiritual, but not religious. Uh, but unfortunately, my father died when I was nine of a heart attack from smoking too many cigarettes. And uh, back, you know, back in the old days, they used to, the military used to just give cigarettes to military personnel. He got hooked and he never could quit. And he died of a heart attack in his 40s when I was nine. So uh, I pretty early on experienced this change in social status where, where you know, my father was a respected professor and then my mother had a, like a, 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 an associate degree in business from a business college, uh, but she needed to work for the US military so that I could continue to go to US military schools. And then so um, she worked the night shift at the US military hotel at Yokota Air Force Base, and I really saw how people are treated differently based on race, um, ethnicity, gender, and socioeconomic status. You know, I, I'll never forget one night I was in my mom's um, 
waiting for her, and I was in the office next door so people couldn't see me, but like a, a, a military sergeant called and said, hey, my kid peed in the bed, I need someone to change my sheets. And I remember my mom saying, there's no one here, I'm the only person here. We don't have any housekeeping staff here now at this time of the night. Uh, it was like 10 o'clock or so. But I have fresh, clean sheets here. If you can come down, um, you, I can give them to you. And I remember him coming and throwing the wet sheets in her face. And, and I remember my thinking, wow, people, I can't imagine that people treat people like this. And so I, I remember as a young person vowing that I was going to get a good education. And then if I ever got into a position of authority, I would never treat people the way they treated my mom. Um, so I, um, I did, because my dad died and I was the only child, I became very independent. I read a lot. I became a voracious reader. In Japan, also in the winter, the sun sets at four. I mean, you know, I was, I was like, it was dark and I would do a lot of reading. So, but my dad's dream was to retire teaching at the University of Hawaii. That's what he wanted to do. He wanted to retire and then just become an adjunct at UH Manoa and have me go to school at UH. And my dad was buried at Punchbowl and I knew that my mother eventually would be. So, you know, Japanese style, you gotta take care of your parents' grave, right? So I, um, I decided I was gonna to come to the University of Hawaii. So in 1974, so you can figure out my age, I was born in 57. I was actually, I graduated from high school a year early, so I was 16, and I started at UH, walked on to the first tryouts for the UH first intercollegiate Wahine basketball team. And I made the team, because there weren't that many people, right? I made the team, and then the coach, Patsy Dung, offered me a scholarship. And I said, what? Why am I getting a scholarship? You know, I just wanted to play. I did, my, I had paid non-resident tuition, you know, and I was like, I can't believe it. All I wanted to do was play basketball because I had played basketball for the U.S. Military High School League in Japan, and I had also played for the, U, um, the military women's team because back then they had a military women's team but not enough women in the military. So they let dependents play. So I got to play on that team too when I was in high school. So I played a lot of basketball um, in, uh, in high school. Came here, tryouts, made the team, got a scholarship. I'm like, why? And then I found out it was because of this law called Title IX, and, which had passed in June of 1972. And I'm like, well, what is this law? And I found out that before this law, in 1972, University of Hawaii had no, no women's athletics. And in 1974, there was high school volleyball here, but there was no girls high school basketball uh, for like the OIA. And the, and the ILH, I recall, they just had like a tournament. They didn't really have a league play. So there was very little basketball, women's sports in Hawaii at that time, very few opportunities. And Title IX, uh, was a law that said that any educational institution receiving federal funds, whether from primary, secondary, or university, cannot discriminate on the grounds basis of sex and cannot uh, have, to, uh, have to afford equal opportunities and for participation. And that's why the University of Hawaii, after Title IX passed, started a Wahine athletics program with a $5,000 budget by a doc woman named Dr. Tanis Donna Thompson, who was the director of women's athletics, she knew of this person, Patsy Dunn, who became my coach, who was a Farrington High School bas uh, Farrington High School PE teacher. And because there were so few opportunities for girls back then, she formed a an organization called the Kalihi Jets to allow the girls to play sports. It started with like. A volleyball, then added softball and basketball because back then there was nothing for uh, the girls. And so Dr. Thompson knew of Patsy Dung, asked her to coach the first U UH Wahine basketball team. And Patsy, after a long day at work, would come to UH Clum Gym back then um, to start coaching our team at 5:30. So we practiced 
at dinner time every day after the guys. And I remember sometimes we're banging on the door, let us in because they, they wouldn't, they, would, they had the doors locked and they wouldn't open the door even at 5.30. It's like, it's, it's our turn, you know, we shouldn't have to wait, right? You, you get to practice from 3.30 to 5.30. We don't get to practice till 5.30. I just, I, I mentioned Patsy Dunn because she was a real inspiration to me. And uh, she was a woman uh, who uh, went to Roosevelt and then went on to Michigan State way back uh, when, but three days ago she died at age 87. And uh, she was a real inspiration to me, so I want to honor her memory. She taught me a lot. She taught me a lot. So, um, so, you know, so I thought, wow, Title IX. And then I found out that this law was, was written and championed and passed through Congress by this person who was born in Maui, graduated from Maui High, went on to school in the mainland and couldn't, got put into a, uh, 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 the international dorm, which was only for people of color, right? And so she fought against the, the, uh, the segregation uh, at the University of Nebraska uh, dormitories. She got that policy changed. Um, she came back and graduated from the University of Hawaii because she fell ill. But she was really, really smart. She was the first woman uh, student council president at Maui High School. And she was such a leader and so smart. Uh, but when she came back to Hawaii, she wanted to go to med school. No med schools would admit her because she was a woman. So then uh, somebody said, well, why don't you try law school? She applied to law school. She got into the University of Chicago Law School. They admitted her as an international student. I guess Chicago didn't know that Hawaii was a territory then. It was a part, considered part of the United States. But they admitted her as an international student. And um, she was like, if you look at the class picture, it's just all these white, white guys and her in her, in her law school picture. <laughs> um, and then she came back to Hawaii. She married a Holly guy, uh, a geologist named John Mink. So she comes back to Hawaii. They have a baby. They come back to Hawaii. She can't get a job. She can't get a job. Nobody will hire her. She's a woman. She's a mother. Nobody will hire her. So, you know, she uh, worked for the, she finally got a job at the Attorney General's office, but she uh, ran for uh, office, state office in the 50s, State House, State Senate, and then in 1964, she became the first woman of color elected to the United States Congress in 1964. In 1972, she got this law passed called Title IX. And this woman's name is Patsy Takemoto Mink from Maui. It's really important that her legacy be known and considered that this tiny Japanese American woman from Hawaii changed. I think she was one of the most important people of the 20th century. Because of Title IX, in 1972, only 7% of US law school graduates were women. Only 9% of US medical school graduates were women. They routinely discriminated against allowing women. And Title IX is for equal opportunity. How many male nurses do you think there were in 1972? There were certain professions that were favored, certain educational paths favored toward women, certain ones favored uh, toward men. And so Title IX says you can't discriminate. We've come a long way. We're not all the way, all the way there yet, but we have definitely come a long way. Um, so in any event, I was just so inspired and I thought, wow, the law can make this much difference in the lives of people. And because of Title IX, I got a basketball scholarship. I was able to be admitted to the University of Hawaii William S. Richardson School of Law. My class had about one-third women. I will tell you right now, the UH Law School has about 60% women. All law students in the United States now, about 55% are women. So that's the difference Title IX has made. Medical school now, too, I understand, at UH is more women than men. But so, and then, uh, the, uh, not, so Patsy Mink was, Takemoto Mink was a super inspiration for me to think about the law and how people can make a difference for e equality, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, but uh, an uh, another inspiration for me was a, a Wahine basketball player, a volleyball player who graduated in 1976. Her name is Marilyn Moniz. 
And she was a Wahine volleyball player. And in 1976, she got what's called the Jack Bonham Award, which is for the best scholar athlete at the University of Hawaii system. Back then, they, now they give it to one guy and one woman. But back then, they only gave it to one person. And she was the first woman to receive this award. <coughs> and then she went to law school. And I remember thinking, wow, athletes can go to law school. And then I thought, thought about Patsy Mink, and I'm like, you know what, I think I want to go to law school. So I, I, because actually I was studying in undergrad to be a Japanese English interpreter. Because Japanese is my first language, I'm fluent in Japanese. So I was going to be an interpreter, but then I thought, you know what, I don't want to just interpret what other people are saying or translate for other people. I want to give people a voice and then also to have a voice myself. So I decided to go to law school. I graduated in 1982 from Richardson Law. And you know, there, I, hope, I hope you folks aren't going through things like this now. But like when I interviewed, we have on-campus interviews for jobs, for like summer jobs. And I remember one of the partners, a Japanese American guy asking me, hey, if you come to work for our law firm, you realize you can't uh, leave for PTA meetings during the day. I'm like, okay, yes, I know that. And he goes, well, uh, do you plan to work for us for a couple years, get married, and quit? It, I was like, you got to be kidding. I mean, you know, I was very nice, very nice. And I said, can I ask you a question? And he said, sure. And I said, do you ask your male applicants these questions? And then he was kind of taken aback, but he said, well, you know, um, he said, no, you know, anyway. So. Uh, I, right after the interview, I reported him to the campus, um, uh, the recruiting center, and I said, this, this interviewer, is, he's a name partner, he's still a name partner at a prominent law firm, I'm not going to name him, uh, he's very, very nice to me now, but I said, <laughs> well, uh, I, said um, I said, he's asking illegal questions and this cannot continue. That night, he called and offered me a job, but I said, no, thank you. And I decided to go work for a different firm, which had people that were actually supportive from the beginning, right? So I, um, I'm going to backtrack, because I forgot to mention one thing that I was going to mention. When I started playing basketball here in 1974, one of my teammates is uh, from Haiku, Haiku Village. And um, I would come out here all the time and hang out at Kaneohe District Park with a lot of people from the windward side. And um, just, you know, I was just this young 16, 17 year old kid. But some of these people were like Frank Hewitt and um, a guy named George Helm. Um, and so when I think back, I realize how lucky I was from the beginning to be exposed to people that became um, Hawaiian leaders, um, you know, I, as a freshman, I was exposed to these people. They they wouldn't know who I am, but I was just this young kid, kind of like hanging out. But I was really influenced by you know um, what like George Helm, Kaholava, and all that stuff. And um, anyway, uh, so I have really fond memories. This is 50 years ago. I was hanging out at Kaneohe District Park with my friends here. Um, so in any event, I, 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 after law school, I went to work for a firm called Goodsell Anderson, Quinn and Stifel. I did civil litigation. And, um, you know, I think I started some of the stuff about you know, trying to help people. Uh, I, I was asked to serve on, and I served on the Honolulu County Committee on the Status of Women. And then I served on the board of an organization that provides pro bono legal services. Uh, which means free legal services to indigent people that don't have money. Um, and I, I went to the managing partners of the firm and I said, hey, you know, um, as lawyers you have, you're, you're supposed to, they pay by the hour and you, you're supposed to bill a certain number of hours. It's 1800 basically in Hawaii. And I said, can you create a billing category for uh, what is now volunteer legal services Hawaii and allow associates, not the partners, but these young lawyers, to bill 50 hours a year toward that to help people that can't afford services. So this is like family court cases and stuff. And uh, the partnership, lo and behold, said yes. So it was great. And to this day, that law firm Goodsill is the most, uh, provides the most 
pro bono hours to the Volunteer Legal Services Hawaii. Uh, but um, I, in the mid-80s, there was a second wave of Japanese investment, and one of the clients uh, was buying like golf courses and hotels in Waikiki and in other parts of the state. And he, uh, he asked me to become in-house counsel. So I, I, I figured I was close to partnership, but I decided, hey, this is kind of interesting. I would like to travel and see the world. So um, I traveled around the world with the owner of this company making an investment, basically real estate investments. Um, you know, traveling first class, flying on what is now, it doesn't even exist anymore, but a supersonic jet called the Concorde that was transatlantic transatlantic, you know, just flying first class, drinking the best Bordeaux wine, <laughs> staying at the Ritz, staying at the Waldorf Towers. What a life. And then I realized, wow, I'm around a lot of rich, powerful people that are not happy people. And after about three years, and then the Berlin Wall fell, uh, we were, we had just come, it was still the Soviet Union, we had traveled across the Soviet Union looking for uh, investment opportunities. We ended up not investing in the Soviet Union, uh, now Russia. Uh, well, it was just the Russia part of the Soviet Union. But um, Berlin Wall fell and I decided, you know what, I wanted to give back to this. It was time for me to go into public service. I had all this great experience, international experience, great uh, law experience, all, you know, jury trials. Um, but I decided I wanted to give back to the community that had given me so much, the people of Hawaii. So I decided, how am I going to do that? And, and I remembered when I was a first year law student, uh, one of my uh, law professors had been appointed to become a judge. And I'm thinking, wow, law, law professors or lawyers can become judges and then at that time there was a young there was a woman a Japanese American woman who became the first not only the second and the third woman to be appointed a judge in Hawaii uh, the first uh, non Hawaii woman her name is Marie uh, Nakanishi uh, Milks right and uh, she became a mentor to me so I decided I'm going to apply to be a judge and um, in Hawaii, to be a judge under our state constitution, you, there's a committee and, and they choose who they think is the four to six best people. And then the n name is submitted for selection. Uh, the first time I applied, I didn't make the list, okay? But I was really, really lucky to, be, to get uh, a job as an assistant professor at the law school. So I taught at the law school for two and a half years. And then a woman who had been two years ahead of me in law school and was also a friend, said, you know what, she was a judge and she got promoted to the circuit court. And she said, Sabrina, I'm gonna help you apply for my position. And she helped me through the entire application process. And then I did make the list the second time and then I got selected. So in uh, November 29, 1993, I was sworn in to become a district court judge here. And then in, um, uh, in and then in early um, 1995, see, okay. So to backtrack, uh, this is about when I'm like 30 years old, right? So in 20, when I was 25, I came out to my mom uh, as a lesbian and she uh, was not very supportive. Um, but she, then she got cancer and so she retired in 1991 when I started teaching and I brought her to Hawaii, and she lived here um, until 1997 when she died. But um, she, um, when in 1995, it, it looked like she had a recurrence. And I thought, I'm gonna regret it if she dies without ever seeing a grandchild. So in, this is 1995, so it's like 30 years ago. It was kind of unusual, but I went to a sperm bank, and I got pregnant. And um, when I was interviewed for circuit court uh, by the new governor, Ben Cayetano, um, I was, I had just tried to get pregnant and uh, I wasn't pregnant yet, but I was trying to get pregnant at that time. Uh, and I had my first baby in February of 1996 and he's now a lawyer in New York. 
Um, but, um, uh, and then I decided, and then a woman entered my life and she became my partner. We, we, we joked about it, like she fell in love with my kid first, really is what happened. <laughs> Not with me, but it was my kid. And then I said, with her in my life, I think I can have one more. And I wanted to give my mom more incentive to live because she took care of my older son every day. Um, and then in um, August of uh, 1997, I, got, I did, was successful in getting pregnant, uh, but unfortunately my mom died in October of 1997 of cancer. So I had my uh, daughter in April of 1997 same sperm donor, same sperm donor, and then my then partner gave birth to another son, same sperm donor, four years later. So I have three children now. It, it's it's great. They're my uh, they're my <coughs> they're my joy. But anyway, so I was uh, working for this Japanese company, and I burned out. And then I was a law professor in 1991 when I brought my mother over. And then one of the things is, uh, at that time is, um, you know, when you're dealing with family stuff, I don't think I was as productive as a law professor as I should have been or could have been if I wasn't dealing with taking care of my mother. But, you know, life is like that. You know, you're gonna go through these phases that sometimes you gotta prioritize family. Uh, but I was really lucky to get a judgeship two and a half years later, and I, um, so, you know, just as uh, the, the, that judge helped me, her name is Judge Bambi Hefo. Um, uh, she helped me. Um, since I became a judge, I have taken my responsibility to try to help others as people have helped me, right? Um, and um, I, I was a criminal judge, a civil judge, and a family court judge. And in family court, I learned certain things. Um, I, I headed family court from 2009 to 2011 when I joined this court. But as a family court judge, I learned, there were all these studies that we read, and I learned that like a third or four, third, about a third of homeless youth are LGBTQ plus, right? Actually, it's, the transgender community is, it's, it's really bad. Um, and I learned that LGBTQ youth are four times as likely to attempt suicide. But I also learned that LGBTQ youth that come from families that reject them are eight times as likely to attempt suicide as LGBTQ youth that come from families that accept them. I also learned that whereas about 80% of white, howly, white kids come out to their parents. It goes down to about 70% for Hispanic or Latino, about 60% for black, and it was only 50% for Asian and Pacific Islanders. And why? Why are Asian and Pacific Islanders not as likely to come out to their families? It's because we know our parents' attitudes toward the LGBTQ community, because we're growing up with them, right? we know that they're more likely to reject us, which is what happened to my mother, initially with my mother. And it took a long time for me dealing with my mother. I tried to help her because she wouldn't go to counseling. And I said, Mom, you should you know, talk to somebody about your daughter being a lesbian because she was having such a hard time with it. Um, but she wouldn't go to counseling. And it's kind of ironic that I'm the one that had to help her. I, I became her counselor, you know, it's not your fault. It's not anything you did. And, and it's okay. I can be happy, you know, because she, remember until 1973, uh, you know, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychological Association included homosexuality as a, as a um, mental disorder until 1973. And that was when I was a senior in high school. So, you know, my mom's from the generation that being gay is a psychological illness, right? And we now know that's not true, right? But that's how it was treated 50 years ago. And my mom was born in 1923, you know? She's from a completely different generation, so I had to help her through me being gay. That was kind of interesting. Uh, but. Um, 
So in a, as, a, uh, as a judge and a justice, um, oh, let, let me backtrack, okay. So I was a family, uh, uh, from 1995, I became a circuit court judge. Um, and from 2000, I started applying to our appellate courts, our intermediate court of appeals, and then to our Supreme Court. And I think I, and to federal court, and I think I applied 14 times and made 12 lists. But I was never selected, okay? From 2000 to 2010, I was not selected for any of these positions. Um, and, you know, from 2002 to 2010, uh, we had a Republican governor, and I was much too liberal for her. So, you know, at this level, it becomes, it does become political. <laughs> it's okay. But in 2010, uh, a new governor was elected, Neil Abercrombie, and in, in January of 2011, he appointed me. So that's why I got to be a Supreme Court Justice. But when I was appointed, because of what I had learned in family court, and then my then partner was there with my kids for the press conference, and the media was like, who are you? And she, and she said, oh, that's my, I'm her partner. And they said, partner? Like law partner? She goes, no, no, I'm not a lawyer. She's a SPED teacher. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, um, uh, personal partner. And, and then the media was like, wait, can we talk to her about that? And then so we had a family discussion and we agreed that it was important for me to be out and public uh, because, uh, especially because of what the Asian and Pacific Islander kids are not coming out. And it, it wasn't just to provide, because I think representation matters. You know, I think it's important for you to see people in certain positions and people that look like you or have similar backgrounds to you or whatever and think, oh, that person did it, I can do it too, right? So I wanted to be open and out. Um, it's easier to be closeted. I mean, I wasn't really closeted. Uh, I wasn't closeted because I was out in my workplace and the people, you know, I would bring my partner to uh, lawyer functions and judge functions and things like that. But I, it wasn't like public, right? I mean, the people that came to my court did it. You know, I didn't talk about it. You know, really no reason to. Um, and, but I decided it was really important uh, for the young people to, you know, have more of an example of, of what you can do. And that you can have a have you can have children, and you can have professional success. Uh, and I also wanted the parents to see that, you know, if they have kids that are LGBTQ, uh, to not reject them because they can have kids. You know, we can have a full life, and not think that because of that you can't have a happy and full life. So I decided to be really open. So I, I talk about this a lot because I think it's important. Uh, and, but, and I, you know, and I remember being interviewed at that time and like uh, on Olelo and I, I said, I hope we get to the time that people are judged on their, their qualifications and on the content of their character instead of these like labels, right? And I'm happy to report that on January 12th, uh, we have five justices. One of our new justices uh, that was just appointed is also a lesbian woman. And um, the media didn't mention it at all, even, although she's out. It, it, it's not even mentioned anymore. It's not even something that, oh, lesbian judge, or you know, or you know, it's like, it shouldn't be lesbian justice. It should just be justice, right? It shouldn't be women justice. It should just be justice, right? Uh, or you know, whatever ethnicity you may be. So I think things are getting a lot better. I've tried to use my position and platform to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, I speak a lot to different organizations and groups, and I speak to kids, I speak to high school students, college, law school, and you know, try. Right now you guys see me and you probably think, oh, she's, you know, she's someone that's successful and confident. I wasn't like this when I was your age. I had so many self-doubts, right? Um, so I want you guys to know that you can do anything too, right? You can be anything you want to be, right? 
Um, just so recognize that. I mean, I wasn't always comfortable speaking in front of groups of people like this. It's just something that you just have to keep practicing. Um, so I, do, I, I encourage people to apply. Now, one thing that I have found, and I recognize that because I always went through, you know, what they call like imposter syndrome. I still deal with imposter syndrome sometimes, right? Um, like, uh, you feel like, oh God, I didn't go to the best schools, you know, and all this kind of stuff. Um, uh, but, um, but, and I also found there's an article in the magazine called The Atlantic. It's called The Confidence Gap. And it talks about how women, it's about women, but it talks about how women uh, won't apply for a position unless they meet, like, meet or exceed the minimum qualifications that's set. Whereas men will apply even if they only meet 60% of the minimum qualifications. Uh, I saw that as, a, that as the family court, I was the, what they call the, like the presiding judge, the lead judge of family court. I sat on a committee that appoints, recommends to the chief justice for appointment, what we call per diem, which is pro tem or uh, lawyers that serve as judges for a day when, uh, when judges are on vacation, right? When the lower level judges are on vacation or are sick or there's a vacancy, lawyers fill those part-time, become part-time judges, right? So I sat on this committee and you know we were interviewing new applicants and I'm looking at these resumes and I'm looking at these women and I'm looking at them going, why are you applying to be a, a part-time judge? You're so well qualified. You could be a full-time judge right now. You're so well qualified. And then I see these applications from some of the guys that they're lawyers, they're qualified as lawyers, but they have never ever set foot in a courtroom as a litigator. And so, I'm sorry, but there's different kinds of lawyers. There's business lawyers. My son is a business lawyer. He doesn't go to court, you know. He's not gonna be a judge. There's business lawyers, there's nonprofit lawyers, government lawyers, and then there's litigators. And only about 20% of lawyers go to court. You gotta, you gotta have a, been a litigator to be a judge. You have to have courtroom experience. You have to understand how courtrooms work, right? So I was, I was kind of shocked and I saw that. And so what I say to you is whether it's because you're a woman or whatever makes you feel that you, you don't belong, I'm here to tell you that you do belong and that you should try. You should try. And remember all the times I tried to become uh, a judge or become a, 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 an appellate judge or Supreme Court justice and all the times that I didn't get it, if I hadn't kept trying, I never would have made it. So you guys got to keep trying, right? And um, so a, a lot of, I do a lot of things. Uh, I've worked on court, I've worked on our dress code so that, you know, it's not discriminatory between men, women, and LGBTQ people, right? As to what people can wear to come to court. I work on uh, court rules to try to make them gender neutral. I worked on uh, including gender identity and gender expression as prohibited categories of discrimination under the code of judicial conduct. So judges cannot discriminate. And we work on things about, you know, how do, like if, you, if you're not sure, you know, how do you deal with uh, respecting people's pronouns, respecting what, what the names, you know, they want to use, things like that. Another thing that I've done, worked on, uh, which really does affect a lot of women, was when I was heading family court, I remember there was a um, uh, Chukis woman with a legal, a grandmother with a legal aid attorney that came to court seeking guardianship of her grandchild. And the legal aid attorney is talking to me and I'm like, um, does your client understand English? And he says, no. And I'm like, I said, okay, we're gonna break this right now. Uh, I want you to come back in one week and we will have a Chukis interpreter for her because it's very important that she understands what's going on. And um, so uh, we did, and then what I did was in family court, which I had authority over, I instituted a policy that for, see up until then we were only providing interpreters for people that were charged with crimes, criminal defendants, or people that were facing termination of parental rights cases, right? People whose 
CPS cases and they were threatening to terminate parental rights. And what I said is I instituted a policy saying that in, in first Oahu family courts will provide free language interpreters and counter assistance uh, free of charge to anyone, anyone participating in the court system. And, uh, and then that was in 2010 and then when I got to uh, the Supreme Court in 2011, I pushed the Chief Justice to make that a, nation, uh, a statewide thing and he agreed and he did it. So we became the first state to provide free interpreters for all people in all case types. It, it, you know, it, it, it tends to affect women more just because um, it's people that can't afford a lawyer, I, a, a, an interpreter, right? And a lot of times they can't afford a lawyer too. Um, and uh, I've, I've been really active in domestic violence issues. As at, I used to be a domestic violence judge and I've been um, in, a, uh, I headed family court. I, we have like this conference of uh, 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 people that deal with domestic violence issues. We try to make things, you know, no system is perfect. But we try to make things easier for, um, for victims or survivors of domestic domestic violence. Um, I'm actually going to go to Okinawa next week to speak about domestic violence um, because their Japan system is so far behind. And uh, as an aside, I will tell you that I think it's the, one of the reasons that domestic violence is taken so seriously in the United States now, and it's not perfect, it depends, but is because we have so many more women lawyers and women in law enforcement and women in education and women in positions of power and that's because of Title IX. I, I you know, it, 50 years ago, if, if there was people called and there was a domestic violence, the police would say, oh, this is just a family matter and leave. And now we have all these laws to try to protect the victim, whoever the victim is, right? So I, it does make a difference. So I'm, um, I've tried to make uh, rules that are, uh, I was really actively involved in trying to, uh, we, we now, sexual harassment by an attorney is now attorney misconduct. I got that included. Um, and, uh, and it's not just sexual harassment on the job, but it's like, if it's like at a lawyer's or a judge's function and, the, you know, like a partner is kind of like coming on to a, a young woman and kind of suggesting that if they get together, she might get a job, you know, that type of thing. Or just harassing people, you know. Um, it's now considered um, attorney misconduct that you can be disciplined for as a lawyer. Um, and let's see, a lot of opinions uh, that I write, um, I've tried to increase access to justice uh, by making it easier for people to come to court and not their, get their cases dismissed, to have their cases heard on the merits, especially if you don't have a lawyer that will actually go do the legal research ourselves and try to figure out what they're trying to say and what they're trying to do. So we've had, I've written a bunch of opinions that have like um, people that, women that have uh, represented themselves have won at the Hawaii Supreme Court. Uh, we also created an appellate pro bono program where, where people that come to the Supreme Court and don't have a lawyer, uh, pro bono lawyers will represent them. Um, I, write a, I write a lot about um, women's issues, um, about domestic violence, gender bias in the courts. I've also been really involved in implicit bias issues uh, within the judiciary. We have mandatory implicit bias training because implicit and cognitive biases still exist, right? Um, so uh, we're, we're conscious of it. Uh, it was really interesting. You know, our first in, um, implicit bias training, we did the Harvard IAT. Has anyone heard of the Harvard IAT? Yeah, okay. So Harvard uh, Implicit Association Test. Just go online, Harvard IAT. And you can go online and take these tests. And I did the first one in front of the entire state judiciary, and, and I did it on women in the profession, working women, professional women. And it came out that I had implicit biases against working women. 
What I'm trying to tell you is to recognize that because of the culture, and it depends on how you grow up and the cultures and society and you know, what, how you're growing up, you can have implicit biases against yourself, your own groups. I, have implicit, I had implicit biases against LGBTQ people, of people with darker skin color. And it's, it's I'm, a, I'm sad, but it's the group that, it's the society in which I grew up. So recognize that, you know, and we've talked about this sometimes, like not all women, especially women my age, are supportive of other women. There seems to be a tendency, like sometimes in law firms, they think there's only room for one woman, and so they, they're not necessarily supportive of the other women. So it's really, really important. Uh, there is much more room. There's room for at least 50% women in everything, right? And so it's really important to recognize that we all do have implicit biases and we have to fight them ourselves and that we have to be supportive and reach out our hands to other people. And, it, and it's not, to me, it's not just about women or LGBTQ people. It's about people of socioeconomic status. You know, I'm, we're really trying to, um, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm encouraging this Tongan woman to go to law school. We don't, we've never had a Tongan woman lawyer here, as far as I know. We're trying to increase the number of uh, Micronesian lawyers. We haven't had a Micronesian judge. You know, we need representation, right? So, um, um, so when you, whatever you're doing, be supportive of each other, help each other. And just like, you know, I was helped by like a former judge. I've been helped all along by people that supported me. And it wasn't just women, it was men too that have helped support. In, in, and so that's what we all have to do for each other. I, um, I do a lot of, you know, I write in Japanese law review articles. I wrote about Dobbs and abortion rights. Um, and um, so I just want to leave you with you. I also talk, I speak in like India. They have so few women judges. Um, so we have to support each other. Um, Title IX, I mentioned it. In 1950, there was only 3%, less than 3% of attorneys in the United States were women. Now it's 39%. And now for federal judges, 39% are women. Um, in, uh, in state courts, only 34% of judges overall are women. But um, Hawaii, we're actually doing better. 42% of lawyers in Hawaii are women. 50% um, of our state court judges are women. And 60% um, of the law school is now women, 55% nationwide. Um, so we still have a way to go. It, it's really much better for the social sciences, but you know, for like uh, STEM, uh, there's still not as many women and not as many women professors. So we still have a way to go, but we have come a long way. And I believe I have stood on the shoulders of giants like Patsy Takemoto Mink and Patsy Dung and Marie Nakanishi Milks and Bambi Hifo. And I hope that all of you can stand on the shoulders of people like me to move ahead. And as you do so, please support each other. Okay? Aloha. Thank you. Thank you.